Okay, good morning. Everyone is still under a lot of stress and everything is still tense, right? Everyone is still worried about their health and at the slightest symptom, they, they naturally opt to stay home and see how it goes. Thank you for coming and being on time. Today I'm going to talk about the next Machiavellian book and in order to introduce it properly we'll spend some time talking about the life of the author Sherlock Perkins Gilman and there is a reason for that because in many ways especially during her lifetime she was famous she was kind of a social celebrity based on the events on her of her life and the echo that those events had in society, positive and negative. I will talk about a series of episodes, we'll talk about some of her works that helps us understand the intellectual framework of the novella Benigna Machiavelli that we're going to read from and then I will introduce the themes, the significance of some episodes that you find at the beginning of the first series of excerpts that I posted online. There are two pages devoted to Benigno Machiavelli. Also, I added a few links, links to two biographies from the Encyclopedia Britannica, but also from Wikipedia, and the Wikipedia page is longer, provides more details, and is essentially well done and sufficiently accurate. You can uh, rely on that as well. I also posted a link to probably the most famous short story by Perkins, which is the yellow wallpaper, and you'll find actually a photographic reproduction, a digital reproduction of the original pages uh, of, of the magazine where the novella was published and also besides the excerpts from Benigna Machiavelli you find excerpts from another essential relevant article on social ethics an essay a short essay on social ethics that I will discuss briefly and you may want to have a look at that as well especially the last couple of pages in that article, okay? So, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was born in 1860 in Artwork, Connecticut, to a lower middle class family with uh, marriage and marriage problems and uh, economic issues as well. Uh, husband was probably abusive to Perkins' mother and after a few years, a few years after Charlotte and her brother were born, her, their father left the family and the family moved around a lot between Connecticut and Rhode Island facing those economic issues and this also affected the education of Charlotte Perkins. She was clearly brilliant and in many ways she self-educated herself in Rhode Island. Eventually she went to a design school to become a graphic designer. And that justifies also the fact that she then married an artist, although it was not a happy marriage. Later on in her life, she moved to California, spent uh, time in Northern California and Southern California. She spent time in Pasadena, for example. Eventually, she came back in New York and spent more than 20 years in New York City after the year 1900, then to return in the 1920s to Connecticut, where she died. In 1884, as I mentioned, she married this artist by the last name of Stetson. She felt, she, she left a lot of notes about her life and a memoir. 
she felt from the beginning, her gut feeling was that she should have said no when he proposed to her. But eventually they got married. Uh, soon, within a few months, they had, she, she was pregnant. And the next year in March of 85, she gave birth to a daughter. She probably suffered from postpartum depression um, after that, but it could be uh, the result of the whole situation. Uh, she was uncomfortable with this. By 1884, she had already had at least a couple of romantic relationships with other women. And I'm using this traditional term because Charlotte Perkins herself was very private about the nature of those relationships and used terms such as romantic, which were ambiguous enough, uh, or uh, stated in public documents that uh, those relationships did not have a, were not sexual in nature. Um, because of her unhappiness with the marriage and her psychological state, uh, Perkins moved to California with her daughter and during the 1880s, she saw her husband on and off. They lived together only uh, part of the time. Eventually, in 1888, they separated, uh, which was kind of scandalous at the time. And only in 1894, they divorced officially, and her husband married uh, uh, Charlotte's best friend with whom she had lived in California during this period. And uh, after uh, a bit of time, Perkins sent her daughter to them. The couple went back to the East Coast and Perkins sent her daughter, uh, entrusting her daughter to her former best friend and her former husband. And this had some echo in uh, a variety of communities. During the, 19, in the 1890s, she uh, um, made her living as a journalist for different magazines. She became somewhat famous with a collection of poetry in 1893, and she toured the United States a lot until the year 1900 as a lecturer, lecturing on public issues, especially on feminism. The term feminist became popular only later on. At this point, the label assigned to what we call now feminism, of which Perkins is, uh, can be considered one of the pioneers, pioneer intellectuals, was the woman's movement or the new woman's movement. She was also lecturing on social issues such as voting rights to women. In 1890, she wrote this short story, which was published in 1892 and is still considered one of the most famous things written by her. It's a dark, short story. Uh, someone defines it as gothic, uh, where we find a woman who spends a few months in a summer house, a woman whose husband is a physician, whose brother is a physician, a woman who suffers from depression and who is assigned to what was called at the time the rest cure. During this time, one of the most common uh, uh, mental conditions that was uh, commonly referred to and the uh, uh, object of a variety of publications from articles in mainstream media uh, to entire books was what was called neurasthenia. And it was blamed on, among other things, the stress induced by modern life. But what is described as neurasthenia is essentially depression. In the case of women, such as the character of the yellow wallpaper, it was not uncommon for doctors to assign a, uh, a therapy, if you want to call it that way, that involved some physical exercise and a lot of mental 
rest or relaxation. In this case, for example, the character in the story is told that she shouldn't be uh, uh, stressing her mind uh, by writing or by other intellectual endeavors if she wants to recover. She's also confined essentially to her house. She would like to go out. She would like to have a more diversified life, a more exciting life out in the world. But following the recommendation of her husband, who's also saying that everything she suffers from is in her head, uh, in, in a, of course, a derogatory way, uh, blaming her for her condition and making her feel guilty about not making enough of an effort to relax and recover, this woman spends a lot of time in her house and by the end of the short story, essentially a lot of time in her bedroom, which has the yellow wallpaper of the story. She would like to change the house, she says at the beginning of the story, but she's not allowed to because her husband says, well, uh, we're only here for three months, so uh, what's the reason to do anything to the house to spend money? She's confined to the house and to this yellow, uh, to this room with a yellow wallpaper, and she starts hallucinating on the pattern, uh, about the pattern of the yellow wallpaper. The pattern is, is not mimetic, it's not the reproduction of any scene, but she starts seeing things in the yellow wallpaper. In particular, she starts seeing a woman that is trapped in the yellow wallpaper. She starts peeling the yellow wallpaper uh, from the walls to free the woman, and the very last and darkest scene in the uh, short story is one where she has peeled the yellow wallpaper entirely. Her husband comes in, and she finds her in uh, a, a state of, of mental alteration so deep that according to the voice of the story, and the story is told with the voice of the woman herself, the husband thinks, remains on the floor, and she moves around in this room trying to avoid the body of her husband. Of course, as I said, this is the story of the character, so the readers are essentially puzzled, uh, perplexed about what really happened, and you can imagine any uh, kind of explanation for uh, not only the fainting, but the state of complete inertia of the husband, which is reduced to what feels like almost a corpse. Did he really faint? Was he, in fact, uh, attacked uh, by and, and rendered um, unconscious by the character of the woman, everything is possible. The story works exactly because of the uh, dark atmosphere that surrounds it. Some of the elements, the medical elements that you find incorporated of the story come from the period when uh, Charlotte was in California and had not separated from her husband yet. Uh, around 1887, she was herself assigned to a rest cure, and you find a lot of interesting details in the article on her life that you find in Wikipedia. Keep in mind that one of the branches of medicine, of public health uh, education during that time was the idea of hygiene. And hygiene meant all the practices all the activities that have a positive or a negative effect on one's physical and mental health based on the, the, the 19th century understanding of biology and medicine. And there were a lot of publications in the US as well as in other Western countries about practices of proper hygiene within the marriage, within society, 
So in reference to the role of a woman in the household and the marriage, what are the practices that lead to the health and balance of the relationship? In the context of society, what are the practices that make citizens and members of the community healthy and therefore productive, mentally balanced, and therefore able to participate in a collaborative way to social and political activities. So it's not, this kind of short story is not limited to the description of characters. It is placed within the discourse about social health and mental health in general. From 1909 on, for about seven years, uh, Perkins, uh, who at that time had moved back uh, to New York City, she had married in 1900 a first cousin, and apparently they had a positive relationship, whatever their relationship was. And in 1909, she started this publication that she essentially produced herself. So every issue of this magazine, The Forerunner, which included articles, essays, fiction, poetry, was written by her entirely, almost entirely by her. And she lived off of the, subscri of the subscriptions. People would be invited to subscribe to this magazine and paying the subscription she would cover the expenses of expenses of printing and sending out this journal and had some money to live herself. It was not uncommon. Magazines were very popular during this time. And uh, it, it was also common to be subscribing to specific niche publications that cater to certain groups, certain issues, and the same issues she was sensitive about, family, women, women in society, uh, were included in the essays and articles and the literature of the forerunner. It is inside the forerunner that we find published in different issues, I think five different issues, uh, we find there the novella entitled Benigna Machiavelli that we are reading from. We also find a very significant article called Social Ethics. And as I said, I've also added a link to, to relevant excerpts uh, from it. Uh, and I'll discuss the content, some of the ideas later. And during this period, the 1900s and the 1910s, she also published essays and works of fiction among the essays one of the most famous is Women and Economics, which talks again about the limited roles assigned to women, about the fact that essentially women are confined to their homes and only assigned to the uh, care and education of their children. Therefore, impacted in a negative way on the growth of society. Herland is a utopian novel where she imagines a world where women, women are, uh, take on the role of provider and some of the male traits are eliminated from society and examines how a society could be organized differently as I said, during the 1920s, she went back to Connecticut. In 1932, she suffered from breast cancer and uh, the cancer kept affecting her health. And therefore, in 1935, meanwhile, the year before, her husband had died, but in 1935, because the cancer uh, was uh, growing, she took her life with chloroform, using chloroform, and, and left a letter, a document, where she was explaining that it was her right to terminate a life, that it was anyone's right to avoid a long and painful period of suffering, and taking her life was 
the most rational decision. And it was yet another instance, uh, another event that made her uh, talked about, right? The newspapers reported some passages from that lecture and discussed it. Social ethics, what are the concepts that you find in social ethics? Um, and again, I, I've selected a, a series of passages that uh, demonstrate what I'm telling you right now. You find uh, there the opposition between nature and society. That is to say, Perkins says that in nature everything is very simple because you find necessity driving the uh, transactions, any kind of interaction among animals. And she uh, subscribed to the idea of Charles Darwin, and in particular, she was uh, a supporter of the idea of Darwinianism. That is to say that whatever Charles Darwin had understood in terms of evolution about the natural world should be, could be and should be adap adapted and applied to society in such a way that the kind of natural evolution driven by necessity that happens in the natural world could be replaced by a carefully engineered and planned kind of social growth that could allow humans to become leaders of their evolution and engineer growth in society in a way that would make society as a whole and the members of society as individual grow more rapidly. Her ideas of feminism are placed within this kind of ideology because essentially she maintains that if you uh, uh, force women just to be uh, in charge of the house and children, then half of society is not participating in this growth. You have a lot of missed opportunities, a lot of wasted talent. And keep in mind these ideas because after Benina Machiavelli we read a completely different kind of uh, book, The New Machiavelli by H.G. Wells, famous science fiction writer from that time, the writer of the time machine, etc., etc. Um, and you'll find very similar ideas, and in both instances, both of these writers and intellectuals converged in developing their Darwinianism in, in, in a way that intersects with ideas of race and ideas of racialism and racism, the racial support of evolution and growth, which uh, involves also a racial exclusion of groups, of ethnic groups and other races. So, she will say, animals don't really have a choice when it comes to interactions, right? Everything happens for a reason that is biological and uh, natural. And anyone who's not aligned with natural evolution is simply eliminated out of it, right? The animals that are not the fittest in any context. In the case of society, she maintains that we need to go back to the basics of a natural ethic. And therefore, the basic idea of ethics for her, as stated in this article, is the understanding that actions have consequences. Actions deployed in society have consequences. And therefore, you have to regulate your actions to influence those consequences or control them. At the same time, she provides a series of examples that are telling of her basic philosophy. She says that ethics can be seen at the level of the individual, at the level of the family, at the level of society. For the individual, she doesn't refer to any of the traditional set of 
ethical ideas borrowed from philosophy or from religion, which gives us a better understanding of uh, the introduction, the very first paragraphs of Benigna Machiavelli, which have to do with uh, the church and what the minister says in church to uh, the, the members of the community who attend the religious functions. Instead of referring to the ethical systems of the past, the traditional ethical systems based on philosophy or based on religion or based on some kind of political and social model, she says, when it comes to the ethics of the individual, let's examine the following examples. Because if we want to be objective, if we want to be serious about identifying what a natural, natural ethics or a nature-based kind of ethics would be, we have to take examples of individuals that live outside of society and are separated as much as possible from society. Therefore, the examples she, gave, she, she gives are someone who is isolated, an individual who's isolated on a remote island, keep in mind the various narratives uh, such as Robinson Crusoe that were very popular uh, in Western culture during the 18th and 19th century. Then she examines the example of an individual who's isolated to a cell in a jail. And finally, she examines the case of a hermit. Of course, she says the first two cases are cases of people, the one on the remote island and the one in the jail, who want to go back to society, who want to who hope to be uh, saved, rescued, the man on the island, liberated and reintegrated in society, the man in a cell, whereas the hermit might be a better example because the hermit uh, doesn't want to be with, with other people, although she says the perfect example of a hermit would be someone who relies on other people's support, who's able to influence other people so that they will provide support, that they will bring food uh, to the hermit. By examining these cases, we can understand what would be beneficial to any of those individuals, and therefore, anything that is beneficial to them in those respective situations would be the foundation of an individual ethical system, right? When it comes to the ethics of the family, she says, well, there it's clear that the ethics of the family, the well-being of the family, will involve a series of sacrifices. Both uh, men and women in the context of the family will have to suffer some losses, which are physical and psychological and can, lead, uh, can include even death, especially in the case of women, of, of men uh, sacrificing their health for uh, the well-being of the family. And therefore, it's clear that we can uh, imagine a natural kind of ethics for the family. However, we don't see the results of a proper framing, Darwinian framing of the issues having to do with the family. When it comes to society, she says, we don't really have an ethics. And her way of saying this is a suggestion, as I said, that society, both when it comes to dealing with the members inside a society, a national society or a community, and also in reference to international ethics, the relationships between different societies, that nothing is being done to ensure proper growth. And what is needed is proper planning in such a way that members of society are assigned to a role that would ensure the growth of society in general, the proper appreciation of talent regardless of gender, regardless of social standing, which, again, is an idea that will be uh, found 
in a more expansive form, even in HG wells, the new Machiavelli. Let's examine some of the ideas in Benigna Machiavelli in this novella. So a novella is a, a simpler uh, novel, a novel with fewer characters, with uh, a, a less complicated arc compared to the traditional novel of the 19th century. You have to read Benigna Machiavelli, which may seem a simple kind of story and may leave you perplexed as to what the author wants to really communicate. You have to keep in mind, as a premise to a proper reading of this novella, that the novella, the invention of the character of Benigna Machiavelli, who's a uh, child of five years, age five is when we find her on the page and then uh, we follow her development throughout her story. And the character is supposed to be a kind of social experiment. That is to say, the character is designed with this idea in mind, what would happen to an individual, in this case, a young female child, if this individual were not uh, subordinated to the indoctrination by her family and by society. So we go back to the idea of a natural development of ethics based on necessity, which in this case are the conditions of Benigna's family, the conditions she is born into. The relationship between her parents, which are not easy, and her father is clearly an alcoholic, and they have economic issues. They also try, clearly, they try to uh, stay in harmony with society, and they conform as a family, as a couple, to these social rules, right? Even if they're not able to, because clearly an alcoholic is not a perfect citizen, and even though they don't feel really intrinsically motivated to align with social values, but they try. Their parents are trying. There is hypocrisy in the characters of the parents, However, there is little or no hypocrisy in the character of Machiavelli. Uh, what the assumption is, what would happen if a member of society grew up deriving their view of society and their rules of ethics when it comes to, inter when it comes to themselves, interaction with members of the family, interaction with society, interactions with society, what would happen if that character was simply driven by a pragmatic view of reality. Not by external influence, not by literature, not by philosophical or religious models, although some of those influences are present, presented in the novella and have an effect on Benigna Machiavelli, right? It's not a completely, cannot be a completely artificial setup. She's still placed within her family. She's still placed within society. She goes to church. However, she decides from this early age that she's in charge of her life and she goes through a series of social, of social experiences as if those social experiences were the, dri the engine driving her ethical education. That is to say, instead of trying to conform to external models, she learns from experience and she builds based on the necessity of her conditions, the circumstances she cannot change, she builds a different kind of personality. Different, unique, because she is not, uh, she, she doesn't submit to what others might want for her. It's necessary to understand that because otherwise, the few examples where you see her acting in a duplicitous way, in a Machiavellian way, would feel incomplete or puzzling because you don't necessarily see the advantage 
the benefit that the character of Benigna Machiavelli gets out of her small victories. You have to keep in mind that whenever those advantages, what she might gain from acting in a Machiavellian way is absent or present, but in a secondary, less than prominent way, you have to keep in mind that those are the trials, the tests for her pragmatic self-education. So the underlying motivation for her Machiavellian behavior is to develop a set of rules that would put her as much as possible in control of her life. Okay? So the true Machiavellian foundation of the novella is not the fact that she will manipulate other people in order to produce a result, a result that she wants. And again, oftentimes uh, her victory is not even made public. So she doesn't enjoy a moment of triumph, the recognition of her masterful strategizing. No. The real foundation, the real Machiavellian foundation is based on this idea that drove Machiavelli, which Machiavelli expressed uh, with the Italian terms realtà effettuale. Realtà effettuale means the factual or effectual reality, which means that Machiavelli suggested directly in the pages of The Prince and indirectly through a series of examples included in that book, that you might look at reality as it ought to be, based on the principles of traditional morality based on philosophy or religious ethics based on the scriptures. However, that skewed view of reality will never really put you in control, will never really place you in a context where you have a proper understanding of what is happening around you. And therefore, with that armed, with that proper understanding, then you can find the instruments to obtain what you are seeking. Realtà effettuale is reality as it is. And reality as it is, according to Machiavelli, includes the understanding that other humans are flawed, that other humans are not behaving in an ethical way very often, or sometimes never. And whether you like it or not, sometimes you have, based on your factual analysis of your circumstances, act in a way that is not ethical. That is to say that a reality-based ethics, of course, we're talking about Machiavelli, this was Darwin, so that's why it's a nature-based uh, uh, ethics, and this is natural necessity, and in the case of Machiavelli, it's a social kind of necessity, but only understanding reality as it is, you will see that sometimes it is perfectly acceptable or even desirable to be duplicitous, to lie, to cheat, to obtain what you need. Of course, in the case of Machiavelli, this ideology was not applied to the single individual, and Machiavelli really wished for society to be organized in such a way with a strong model of leadership, because Machiavelli may be a Republican, right? It's, it's, it's not a monarchist is not a royalist, is not a supporter of the dictatorial leader that is idealized in the prince. His ideal form of government is the republic. Yet, no matter whether society is organized under a prince or with a limited expression, manifestation of republican rights, because Machiavelli's republic was not, based on, on mass democracy, 
regardless, clearly Machiavelli is a supporter of a strong government. And his idea is that a strong government, whether it be led by a prince or by an elite participating in a Republican government, would ensure that boundaries are set for the citizens, for the members of uh, the community, boundaries that force those citizens to act ethically according to traditional principles. So if in reality, if in nature, those citizens would not be honest all the time, under a strong leadership, they will have legal uh, rules and behaviors that are promoted by the government, supported and also enforced through the application of laws and punishments. Machiavelli was a big believer in punishments that would make those citizens act ethically and according to uh, Machiavelli's own belief in Aristotelian ethics, if you're forced to be honest, even simply because maybe you don't want to be honest, but you uh, have to be honest most of the time because you're afraid of the consequences, because you see that there would be consequences to your deviations from uh, those ethical rules. If you're forced to act honestly, day after day, month after month, year after year, eventually, as a psychological habit, you will become what you're doing. You will become honest. Whether you were intrinsically motivated or, in most instances, extrinsically motivated by the fear of retaliation, the fear of punishment, eventually you will become what you have practiced day after day. And according to Machiavelli, that is the foundation to have mature citizens who have embraced what was imposed on them that would be the premise to the possibility of opening the participation to the activities of the government and to leadership to more citizens, to more members of the community. So what really allows us to understand Perkins understanding of Machiavelli lies in here. John focus just on the surface which is a series of rather innocent tricks and rather simple Machiavellian plans. Think of these two elements. One, the idea that the character is getting a pragmatic education from her own experience. She's not learning from other books, other people. She's learning how to control herself and being controlled her life from those experiences, and she's looking at reality as it is. So she's not superimposing on her experiences any kind of religious philosophical model. She's just looking neutrally, objectively, at her situation, at the situation of other people, her behaviors, the consequences of what she does on other people and learning from it. So it's the idea that maybe we could have an individual that is separated from the traditional criteria of education and growing up as a natural human being in a natural way and therefore uh, getting to the core of what was evolution for Darwin, but what is seen as an opportunity for growth in a modern society. If modern society want growth in terms of power, in terms of economic power, military power, intellectual power, right? Any kind of power related to knowledge as well. How can we tap into this? Because the systems that we've put in place so far thanks to philosophy and religion, haven't worked, have only produced a very limited kind of growth and an androcentric kind of growth, where men are driving the growth of society, whereas women are excluded and assigned to menial tasks. 
and Perkins clearly in a variety of documents expresses her preference for a situation where the education and the care of children is delegated as much as possible to the community and to the society to free women to pursue other roles and other careers. So what are some of the episodes that we find in here? I'll summarize them for you, uh, but uh, you, you can read all the details in the readings and then today or another time I want to hear your reactions to the reading, your impressions of those readings. So at the beginning of the story, we find a reference to what the minister is telling people in church. And you find the reaction of the character of Benigna uh, Machiavelli. Essentially, everyone is telling a story. The minister in the church, the literary texts that one can find in a normal household, the words of the parents, the censorship of society, which you find in some of the episodes, and no one is really asking why. Why should I listen to the minister? And from the very beginning you find this young child questioning what the minister is saying and doing in church, and no one is asking why the parents should be obeyed, or why one should conform to the rules and the impositions of society. The first episode where you have the kind of pragmatic education that is one of the focal point in the story has to do simply with ginger cookies. So Benigna and her sister take some cookies from the kitchen. They're caught by her mother. They have their fingers uh, with, with the cookie crumbs. So there is evidence of their malfeasance and therefore, they cannot lie for long. They have to admit responsibility. Only Benigna's sister is the first one to confess. And she's rewarded by her mother, which would be an example of a hypocritical kind of education. She's guilty of uh, stealing the cookies, but she's praised for being honest and confessing. Benigna Machiavelli in this situation turns from actor to observer. And she draws pragmatic or natural conclusions from the episode. So she sees that a punishment is inflicted on her, actually on both, but she can only uh, have count on this punishment, whereas her sister has gotten something positive out of this episode. A reward, nice words, compliments from her mother. So she engineers another episode whereby both children steal cookies again. She tells her sister that she should clean her hand, hands so that there is no evidence and they can effectively continue to lie when caught by her mother. And then, of course, her, their, their mother knows that they have taken those cookies. It doesn't matter whether their hands are clean or not. And this time, Benigna will be the first one to confess. And her sister will receive a harsher punishment, and Benigna will receive the compliment this time. So it is an episode that focuses on manipulation. And it's a very minor form, a very naive, very childish form of manipulation. But what's important about the episode is that the second iteration of this episode is a kind of social test or social experiment, where Benigna is trying to control her mother, is trying to be in control of her situation, has learned something about adults and about her own powers in this situation. The second significant episode you find in the uh, uh, excerpts that I included under Benigno Machiavelli, one, no, numero one in parentheses, has to do with Benigno's parents arguing 
with each other through the night. As I said, her father, the character's father, is an alcoholic, is abusive, which is reflective probably of Charlotte Perkins' experience and uh, own experience. Um, and Benigna hears that argue from her bed. Of course, as a child, naturally, she doesn't want her parents to argue, and she's worried about how this could escalate into violence. And of course, her mother would be the victim of physical violence from her husband. And while she's pondering about this, once again, we have this bifurcated development of narrative. The first time, she just happens to uh, fall and hit her head. Of course, being a, a, a child, she, she cries. Her parents stop arguing and tend to her, right? They're worried about uh, Benigna. They uh, want to see what happened to her. They found some arnica cream uh, to uh, put on her head. And, they, and they, therefore, they stop arguing. Once again, Benigna, within this episode, the first time, is not a full-fledged player. She's a player and an observer. Her observation of this is that she can manipulate the situation, that she has found possibly one way to interrupt successfully any kind of escalation in the arguments among uh, her parents. However, she tries, she has a second attempt at this kind of manipulation, which is only partially successful. She herself has to escalate and falls down the stairs because she feels that only this would work, only escalating the physical level of her uh, injuries would work and be effective at stopping her parents. Her parents, in fact, uh, stop arguing and worry uh, about her. However, ultimately, she's not successful because her parents, after tending to her injuries, uh, understand that this was, in fact, an attempt to manipulate uh, or some kind of reaction to their arguing. And from that moment on, they're not arguing in front of Benigna any longer. And whenever they have to argue, she's placed with a uh, neighbor and excluded from the house so that they can argue as much as they can, and, and she has no control over the situation. Once again, she's involved, immersed in reality, involved in a situation. She takes the role of observer. She draws conclusion, and she devises a pragmatic approach that would involve some kind of solution. So your focus should not be on the episodes themselves, and I don't have time for the other two. I will continue another time. Rather, your focus should be on the pattern, on the mechanism, on the overall goal, which is to show the development of a character, how an individual who's not subject in any major way to the influence of society would build a personality and a set of practices just based on their observation of reality and the pragmatic conclusions drawn from their experiences, okay?